Navarre Beach is special because it's, it's only about a four and a half mile stretch of sand. It's not fully developed. The white sands, uh, the beautiful water that we have here, it's just uh, very peaceful. The fact that we get so many wild sea turtles that just come to this area just naturally, thankfully because of our artificial reef ecosystem, it makes it such a great place to view these animals in their natural habitat. Kemp's Ridleys are the most endangered species of sea turtles out there. So the fact that we have infrequent nesters here on our beaches makes it important for our area specifically. Hi, my name is Kathy Holmes and I'm the founder of the Navarre Beach Sea Turtle Conservation Center and I'm also the Director of Conservation Education and Research. Our mission is the conservation of threatened and endangered species, but it's through the venues of education and research. The Navarre Beach Sea Turtle Center most often are the ones that supply us with our turtles and bring them down. Here at the Gulf Freedom Care Center, we rescue, rehabilitate, and release sea turtles throughout the Gulf of Mexico, while also educating the public about sea turtle awareness. The process of rescue is completely spontaneous. Sea turtles, you never know when they're going to get caught or stranding on the beach. So uh, you can't really prepare for that. You just wait for the phone call and then you send out a mass email to all the other people that are on the uh, stranding permit with us. And whoever can get here first, that's what they do. Get here first and start the process of rescue. This is a Kemp's Ridley. That's the most endangered. <laughs> well, it was astonishment. I was astonished that he was still around. Uh, my first initial thought was, how are you still alive? He was missing a, 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 a large area of his carapace and, and his plastron. And he was missing a flipper. And a lot of people don't realize when uh, natural defense for a turtle, when a shark comes up, a turtle actually turns up like this and the shark really can't get a hold of him too good, and if, unless he's a big shark. And then he slides down, that shark will slide down and grab a flipper. That's why we see a lot of uh, turtles out there with, you know, missing a flipper here or there. But uh, that was a big shark bite out of him. So I was astonished at that. And so he was recovered and brought to the, uh, the Gulf Arium for rehabilitation. When Ray was brought in, he had that shark bite, and so he was still healing a little bit on that flipper that had gotten bitten. He actually still had an open flesh wound there. He also had a few wounds on his plastron. So all of that stuff gets documented and taken pictures of, and of course we address it and clean it up in any way possible. The shark bite other than the flipper looked very well, so we didn't have to treat that at all. Wow, this turtle's been through some trauma, so whatever is wrong with you now, I know you can pull through. <laughs> with Ray, we started him on antibiotics, so we always, if they have any sort of flesh wound, we'll start them on an antibiotic called Ceftaz, which is an injectable antibiotic. So we started him on that right of way to make sure it would clear off any infection that he had from that previous injury. And then we just put him in a 
rehabilitation habitat and watch him swim, make sure he does everything that he's supposed to do. Sometimes they freak out and they're a little stressed. Um, so we always just watch for five to 10 minutes to make sure that they are good to go. So Kim Sirdley's, they're kind of my favorite. They're one, they're super cute. And two, just them being so endangered and then the, being able to get them back out is always super rewarding. One of their favorite prey items in the wild are crabs, blue crabs, any crustacean. They have a really hard uh, beak, so they're perfect for crushing those types of prey items. He actually didn't start eating. We decided to go buy him a crab from the farmer's market down the street, and we put it in there, and he did nothing. He didn't touch it, he looked at it, he swam next to it, they became best friends. I was just like, this is your food, buddy, like you need to eat it, and they, we're best friends, so the crab stayed there eating raised scraps. And then a funny side story is that crab got put into the shark's tank and then it scared the shark. And so they took the crab back out and put it back with Ray. And then one day Virgo that we released a couple weeks ago was in the habitat with the crab and finally ate him. So we weren't sure if there was some GI intestinal issues with that shark bite causing him to not eat. So he was on fluid treatments every three days as well. We do begin tonight with this Category 4 hurricane slamming into the U.S. this Sunday, making landfall just before 1 p.m. Eastern this afternoon. Tomorrow, As we have extremely dangerous Category 4 storm, it's reaching 100 miles per hour. The strongest yeah. 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 They were unable to go out to the sea, so they were brought to the Gulf Arium Care. When the hatchlings initially come out of their nest and go in the water, they, uh, they'll swim out until they find what's called a sargassa mat, and that's just a bunch of seaweed grass floating on, on the water. After they have been in the water and they've expended their energy reserves, they can no longer make it past the break line and into a weed line that they would need. So because of Hurricane Ida, we ended up getting over 100 little baby loggerhead hatchlings. Nebula was washed back on Okaloosa Island right by the fishing pier. We had gotten a call. There was a baby sea turtle washed back um, right off the pier. So I went over there and she was up a little ways. She started to crawl back into the water and then um, a big wave came and just pushed her right back. So I scooped her up and everyone was very thankful that we were able to get her because they've been watching her struggle for probably 10 or 15 minutes in those waves. With Nebula, because she was by herself, she was a little bit bigger. We actually weighed her and took measurements of her just to kind of track her progress. Um, since she was kind of lethargic for a while, she wasn't really swimming. Well, we water test all of our hatchlings, even though we had that big group of them, we still individually put them in the water and kind of see how they're swimming. Are they lethargic? Are they moving? 
And if they are lethargic, we'll keep them in an incubator overnight. And then we give them periodic swim tests during the day. the exact date but I know I was very excited when Ray finally took his first sight. Before we release any of our sea turtles, as long as they are within a minimum straight carapace length, we do two types of tags. So the first one is a metal flipper tag. So if we were ever to catch Ray again, we can kind of track his history. So all of those tag numbers gets put into a big database of all the turtles in America. And then we can kind of follow their history, like where they were tagged before, why were they tagged, if they were in rehab, was it a nesting turtle? So if we catch him again, we will know. Release days are the happiest days. There's been, there's been several turtles that I had the opportunity to get up off the pier transport to the Gulf area, spend the next weeks, months, um, helping feed them, cleaning their tanks. Um, and then, then I finally carry them back out of the crate, put them on the ground and, and watch them go back in, out into the Gulf. It's just that, to me, that is so rewarding. If you're working on a turtle for months and months, and it might be a turtle you don't think is going to make it, and then you get to watch it crawl back into the Gulf of Mexico, that's the most rewarding part. Ray got released out in Perdido Key, Florida. I thought he would struggle to get out, and as soon as we put him on the sand, Ray took off. That was, uh, so there were, I don't know, a hundred and something hatchlings that were brought over to the care center and uh, from Pensacola Beach. I was so anxious, not so much to release them, but that we wouldn't find a weed line. And if you don't have that weed line, you take them back and you try again another day. It could be a couple of miles offshore. It could be several miles offshore, but we're going out on a boat. We're going out, we're going further out and further out. We hit 20 miles, no sargassum mats. We hit like 25, nothing, 30, nothing. I'm thinking, that's it, we're done for the day. And at about 35 miles offshore, south of Destin Pass, we found this huge sargassum mat. And so we had the opportunity, we were releasing these guys out in there and it was, uh, it was pretty awesome. <laughs>
when Neb was released. Love you, Neb. It was a really sad moment. It's like, you know, bittersweet. Like, you're excited, but while they're here, they're so fragile. They're so tiny. And I don't trust them in the pools here. I'm like, how can you make it in this big blue world out here? So it was a very bittersweet moment. And I was excited that she was out there and I knew she was in good company with over a hundred other ones, but just knowing she was on her own was a little sad. <laughs> This whole turtle thing for me, you know, I've, I've lived in this area for 30 years. I've lived out here on the beach for 20 plus years. I never thought I'd be involved with sea turtles and here I am with sea turtles. So that's, that in itself is pretty cool. I never thought I'd be on a sea turtle patrol team and I'm on a sea turtle patrol team. I never thought I would have the opportunity to go out on a boat and release a bunch of hatchlings and here I am, you know, this year I got to do that. So for me, it was just such excitement to, to do that. Hatchlings from that batch were released 35 miles offshore. That was a fun trip. And who threw up? Danny. <laughs> yeah, Bob was like, and I didn't get sick like some people. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs>